in the South China Sea off Singapore, an elite squad of commandos swoops down on a suspicious cargo ship. Uh, Roger, reporting team uh, now inserted. Their target, material for weapons of mass destruction heading toward a port on the Arabian Sea. One deck below over. This is just a practice drill. But the threat is all too real. Terrorists getting their hands on a nuclear bomb that could kill millions. A.Q. Khan, a rogue Pakistani scientist, has done more than any other person or country to spread nuclear weapons around the world. Name a nuclear hotspot and Khan's clients are there. Iran, North Korea, Libya, and perhaps the deadliest potential customer a terrorist network willing to make its own nuclear jihad. This is the story of one man's deadly legacy that spread around the world. How he managed to get away with it for so long, and how the nuclear seeds he helped plant could explode anytime, anywhere. The path to the worst nuclear proliferation scandal in history started here in the Netherlands in the early 1970s. For more than a decade, a young Pakistani named Abdul Qadir Khan studied quietly in Europe, earning a degree in metallurgy. But in 1974, Khan's world changed forever when India exploded an atomic bomb. Pakistan's hated neighbor and worst enemy now had nuclear weapons. And Khan suddenly had a new purpose in life. A.Q. Khan began as a nationalist. At that time, his sole purpose was to take revenge on India. That's when he started appropriating the secrets. From Amsterdam, Khan wrote to the Pakistan government, offering his services. He became, in effect, a spy working to steal the West's nuclear technology. He got a job at a subsidiary of Urenco, the European Nuclear Consortium. This was the holy grail of nuclear power that Khan was after. How to build centrifuges that spin fast enough to enrich uranium to make fuel for the bomb. When caught translating secret Dutch nuclear documents, Khan said he was just writing a personal letter home. Then Khan raised more suspicions by asking too many questions at a nuclear trade fair. Eventually, the highest levels of the Dutch government in The Hague and Western intelligence agencies realized they had a nuclear spy on their hands. Of course, this was discussed. It was known uh, by our intelligence. Rude Lubbers was a cabinet minister at the time. He would soon become prime minister. Safe to assume that already in 1975, Washington was aware that there was a young Pakistani, Mr. Khan, who had uh, stolen knowledge of the enrichment, uh, knowledge technology. Although the CIA was fully informed that must have been, they knew that, that there was still an attitude of, let's say, let's say fair, let it go. When the Dutch were ready to pick up Khan, the CIA and others in American intelligence went to the Dutch and said, no, don't touch him, we want to follow him. David Sanger, the White House correspondent for the New York Times, has been investigating the Khan network for more than three years. He says the CIA's gamble to let Khan go would eventually have devastating consequences. At some point along the way, the CIA lost track of Khan's transactions. They knew where Khan was, but they clearly didn't know what he was doing. 
The CIA knew Khan wanted to build the bomb for Pakistan. They never suspected he would soon have much bigger schemes. In late 1975, Khan fled back to his native Pakistan with his stolen nuclear secrets in hand. Ruled off and on by military dictators, at the time, Pakistan had 50% more soldiers than teachers. But no matter how backward the country was, Khan was given strict orders. Build the bomb at any cost. Those orders came from Pakistan Prime Minister Zulfikar Ali Bhutto. His daughter, Benazir, who succeeded Bhutto after he was deposed and executed, recalls her father's famous words. After India detonated its nuclear device in 1974, he said, we will eat grass, but we will build the bomb. Bhutto called on the Arab world, hardliners like Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat, Libya strongman Muammar Gaddafi, and others to rally behind his push for what he dubbed the Islamic bomb. No matter who is pitted against the forces of Islam. He said it quite clearly that the Hindus have a bomb, the Christians have a bomb, the Jews have a bomb, and the only civilization that does not have a bomb is Islam. Shahid or Rehman, a respected Pakistani journalist, literally wrote the book on Pakistan's nuclear quest. He says Khan set up a vast black market, drawing on the contacts he made while in Europe to get his hands on vital nuclear materials. There is no secret about this. Pakistan's nuclear program is based on borrowing, stealing, smuggling. And American money. Khan's bomb was a weapon for a military that got billions in aid from the United States. It was the 1980s and America wanted a strong Pakistan to take on the Soviets in Afghanistan, even if that meant turning a blind eye to Khan's bomb program. Everybody knew that Pakistan was in the process of building a bomb. Pervez Hoodboy is a lone voice in his country, a nuclear physicist who is also a leading anti-nuclear activist. If you were to stop a cab in Islamabad or Rawalpindi and say, I want to go to the bomb factory, they would know exactly where to take you. And yet the CIA would specify year after year to the President of the United States that Pakistan was not about to make a nuclear weapon. Whatever the CIA knew, what it didn't calculate is that the bomb Khan was building might be attractive to other countries. Because to make fuel for his bomb, instead of using huge, costly plutonium reactors, Khan assembled a cascade of thousands of smaller, cheaper uranium centrifuges, spinning faster than the speed of sound. One little problem with a part, and they tear themselves apart. They explode. He was a genius at making these things uh, work. At the New York Times, when Khan's innovative techniques came to light, they were studied by science reporter William Broad, who joined David Sanger in investigating the Khan network. This flowchart shows the two paths to make a bomb, the plutonium route or the uranium route. And Khan took the shortcut. This is the plutonium route up here. You need reactors and all this kind of stuff. If you've got centrifuges and you can make this highly enriched uranium, you can short circuit all this stuff and just go directly to weapon or device fabrication. This is the, the one-stop shop, the easy, do-it-yourself technique. Which caught the attention of neighboring Iran. Khan was still perfecting his machines, but the Iranians secretly began buying drawings and parts from Khan in deals that eventually gave them about 500 centrifuges. Iran's nuclear program, much of it wouldn't exist if it weren't for the AQ Khan network. All of the technology for the centrifuges came straight from the AQ Khan network. But nobody, not the CIA, nor the weapons inspectors in Iran, understood what Khan and the Iranians were up to. For the next 18 years, Iran would manage to keep its program secret. 
until it exploded onto the world stage as a full-blown nuclear crisis. Back in Pakistan, Khan's years of labor were about to pay off. In May 1998, the mountains of southwest Pakistan would tremble and collapse when Khan and his team exploded a subterranean atomic bomb. The people of Pakistan celebrated the birth of the Islamic bomb and their new nuclear hero, A.Q. Khan. Some people would want to die for him if necessary. To such an extent, he is uh, he's loved, he is admired. Because they, they believe that uh, he has given a bomb to a Muslim country. And why stop at giving the secret of his Islamic bomb to just one Muslim country? When Khan could make Pakistan the hub of the world's largest nuclear proliferation ring. He had harnessed the power of the atom for Pakistan. And now A.Q. Khan reveled in the glory, a hero to the people, and to presidents. In 1999, just a year after Khan exploded his bomb, General Pervez Musharraf seized power in a military coup. A.Q. Khan became the father of the bomb, which is the pride of Pakistan. And yes, indeed, I said he was a hero to me. Yes, we all thought him to be a great man. A great man with an ego to match. His research laboratories were renamed after him. A.Q. Khan was in love with himself, and so he marketed himself relentlessly. He built for himself an empire, and his empire was vast. He owned restaurants, schools, colleges, he had even a, a, a discotheque. And while Khan was growing wealthier, he was also becoming more anti-Western. He was very bitter about the Western society because he couldn't travel to West. He was wanted all over Europe and the United States. The only places that he could visit were the Islamic countries where he was treated like a hero. So he started looking at himself like a champion of Islam. Spurred on by that combination of profit and politics, Abdul Qadir Khan was about to pull off the greatest nuclear proliferation scheme in history. It was a key turning point that the CIA and the West missed. Over the years, they knew that Khan had smuggled nuclear material into Pakistan, but they never suspected he had flipped the switch, reversed the flow, and turned from an importer to a nuclear exporter. Khan came to Dubai, the financial and shipping mecca of the Arab world, to set up his headquarters. He orchestrated a global supply chain that would make Walmart jealous. A factory in South Africa, centrifuge parts from Malaysia, electronics from Turkey, technology from Britain, France, and Switzerland, and a bomb design from China. What the Khan Network did on a larger scale than anybody had ever seen before was um, pulling together a privatized black market network to supply the essential ingredients of a nuclear weapons program. A network Khan built with sales trips around the world. Iraq. Saddam Hussein came close to getting his hands on some very real weapons of mass destruction when the Khan network offered its technology. 
But the Iraqi dictator suspected, wrongly, that it was all a Western plot. He spurned the offer. Next up, Iran. Khan had made his first sale here in the 1980s. The Khan network returned in the mid-90s, and this time sold the Iranians' plans for more advanced centrifuges. Then came an even more lucrative client, North Korea. Ruled by President Kim Jong-il, American spy satellites could easily spot this sprawling nuclear facility which produced plutonium fuel for North Korea's weapons. The North Koreans promised to freeze that program, but then they secretly struck a deal with Khan for his uranium centrifuge system. Much smaller and easier to hide. He delivers the ability to the North Koreans to produce fissile material for their weapons program. Art Brown, today a private security consultant in Washington, D.C., was the CIA's top man on North Korea. And like many of the nuclear spies, he found it hard to believe that Khan was acting alone. Logic sort of tells you that if the father of your atomic bomb program, A.Q. Khan, is visiting a country as hermetically sealed as North Korea 13 or 14 times, either the government was aware and for its own reasons didn't want to do something, or the government was completely inept to figure out where the father of their bomb program is off to this week. The CIA was finally beginning to crack Khan's proliferation ring. When evidence of Khan's global dealings first emerged, Condoleezza Rice was President Bush's national security advisor. She is now his secretary of state. I remember when I first heard about it in an intelligence uh, briefing, thinking, oh my goodness, there are actually people who are selling not just nuclear secrets or nuclear technology, but actually trying to enable uh, countries through a private network to uh, develop nuclear technology. And it was, a, it was a completely different world. It was a really pretty frightening prospect. And it got more frightening. In the summer of 2002, American spy satellites spotted missile parts in North Korea being loaded onto a Pakistani C-130 cargo plane, like this one. They concluded Pakistan was swapping Khan's centrifuge designs for North Korean missile technology. You would think that having caught the Pakistanis this red-handed, that the U.S. would raise a giant uproar. But remember the timing. It was soon after 9-11, and in the fight against terrorism, President Bush called Pakistan's military ruler a stand-up guy. There was clearly a decision made within the Bush administration that you could not embarrass the Pakistanis about their nuclear program and hope to get their help on terrorism. And so, at one point after another, they have covered for the Pakistanis. Which left Khan free to make another sale to Libya. When Libya's leader, Colonel Muammar Gaddafi, wanted nuclear weapons, he knew just where to turn. For $100 million, Khan helped Libya start up a major nuclear weapon facility. Saif Gaddafi is the Libyan leader's eldest son and probable successor. And these days, he's trying to paint a new, friendlier image of Libya, playing a key role in his country's international diplomacy. Touring the world with his own artwork, the younger Gaddafi had a hard time selling his paintings. He will buy this one. But his father had better luck buying nuclear secrets from Khan. To complete uh, our nuclear program, uh, you know, it's a, it's a long process, and it takes time, years. And uh, therefore, it's not just uh, cooking a cake. Uh, it takes time and, you know, uh, uh, efforts. But Khan delivered the cake and the icing. 
From around the world, the Khan network shipped almost everything Libya needed to enrich yellow cake uranium into nuclear fuel. But he also threw in something a little extra. Hundreds of pages of a bomb design based on weapon plans he got from the Chinese. The Chinese bomb design that he had obtained in the mid-80s became the last critical element of his sales package. You buy the car, we give you a toaster. You buy the centrifuges, we give you the Chinese bomb design. The Libyans got a simple how-to guide to build the bomb. It's very simple to say, uh, draft how to manufacture a nuclear bomb. <laughs> Were you surprised how much you were able to get? No. But there was a surprise for the Libyans, and for Khan. By now, American and British intelligence services had infiltrated deep inside Khan's proliferation network. We had a fairly good picture of who the customers were. I can't get into sources and methods or any of the operational uh, techniques. But I can say that the network was thoroughly penetrated. So penetrated that when a ship called the BBC China left Dubai in October 2003, authorities boarded it and knew exactly what crates to open, seizing centrifuge parts the Khan network had shipped to Tripoli. The embarrassing discovery forced Gaddafi to come clean and renounce his nuclear ambitions. That was the good news. The bad news is the Libyans had been at this for some time, apparently undetected. And it raises the question of what other shipments we have missed from the Khan network. That means that somewhere floating out in the world are the components for weapons seeking a home. By early 2004, A.Q. Khan was running out of time. The Libyan seizure had exposed his global black market. Pakistan's military ruler, Pervez Musharraf, faced tremendous pressure from the United States to shut him down. Musharraf says he felt betrayed by his hero. Yes, I told him that on his face when I met him, that you, having been such a great man, where the nation is carrying you, you on their heads. You are a hero. You are in the skies. And you have damaged the country so much. He cried. He had tears in his eyes. It is with the deepest sense of sorrow, anguish and regret. Musharraf forced Khan to apologize on national television. Not in Urdu, the national language, but in English, to convince an international audience he had acted alone. I also wish to clarify that there was never ever any kind of authorization for these activities by the government. In Washington, President Bush hailed Khan's fall from grace as a victory. The AQ Khan network has been brought to justice. The United States has exposed and disrupted a major black market operation in nuclear technology led by AQ Khan. But had the Khan network really been fully exposed and disrupted? After all, Khan built the nuclear bomb for Pakistan's military. Yet General Musharraf, the chief of the army, insisted he had no idea about Khan's proliferation scheme. Nobody in Pakistan knew except him, his organization, and all scientific organizations were totally autonomous. Autonomous financially, autonomous in development, autom autonomous in security. I do not buy this theory that Khan did everything on his own, but maybe it suits Mr. Musharraf to say Khan did everything on his own. Benazir Bhutto has serious doubts about the Khan affair. How could Khan get planes to bring things back and forth? How could Khan leave the country? He couldn't even leave the country. He had to ask for permission. Of course, you know, he could hide it by saying, I'm going on a religious pilgrimage, for example, and you'd get the permission. But how many religious pilgrimages could he make to a country like North Korea? 
So you see, it doesn't add up. Musharraf was not going to let Khan tell his side of the story. The day after Khan's apology to the country, a distinctly uncomfortable looking Musharraf joined him on national television to grant Khan a complete pardon. Khan was put under a loose kind of house arrest. No jail time, no punishment for his illegal nuclear trafficking, and especially no pesky questions from outsiders. Pakistan barred the Americans from any contact with Khan, a restriction that, at least publicly, the Bush administration says it is quite happy to accept. I'm pretty confident that when it comes to the principal goal here, which was to put the Khan network uh, out of business, we have very good cooperation with Pakistan on this matter. Dig half an inch beneath the surface, turn the cameras off, and American officials fume. They are furious. Here is the world's leading nuclear renegade, and yet we have not had direct access to the leader of this group. Which leaves unanswered a lot of questions about what exactly went on behind the scenes at Khan's laboratories, like this meeting in May 1999. It was just a year after Khan had successfully exploded his bomb and he received the only foreign dignitary known to have visited his top secret nuclear facility, Prince Sultan bin Abdulaziz Al Saud, at the time the Saudi Arabian defense minister. Today, he is the Saudi crown prince and next in line to be king. His country remains Pakistan's closest political and financial ally. Saudi Arabia built the world's largest mosque in Islamabad and funneled millions in oil subsidies to Pakistan while it amassed its nuclear arsenal. Saudi Arabia has always been key in the Pakistan nuclear program. The Saudis firmly deny that they have any plans for acquiring their own nuclear weapons. But Middle East expert Simon Henderson, who befriended Khan for many years, is not convinced. I fear that Saudi Arabia has certainly made the decision to go ahead to get a nuclear-capable missiles. I fear that Pakistan is going to be the supplier of them. And Saudi Arabia could be just one of many potential nuclear clients. In his travels, Khan met a dizzying array of people from almost every continent. There were reports of interest in his nuclear wares from Malaysia, Egypt, and Syria, among others. Khan himself was out of business, but not all his associates were. Remnants of his black market network could still be operating. That's why they are so concerned here at the Vienna headquarters of the United Nations International Atomic Energy Agency. The agency's inspectors pored over computers turned over by Libya, Khan's last known client. They discovered that the Khan network had made digital copies of the nuclear centrifuge plans. They have no idea how many copies were made or who got them. That was an absolute wake-up call for everybody. Well, on North Korea, I think we need to start preparing ourselves. Mohammed El Baradai and his agency won the Nobel Peace Prize last year for their work on nuclear proliferation. But he says Khan takes the prize for ingenuity. When we first came to know about the AQ Khan, you know, network, it was, to me, mind-boggling. You know, I never, in my wildest dreams, imagined that you can have a Walmart, you know, a, a, a fully operational uh, network uh, trading nuclear material, nuclear equipment. It was a whole new picture for the UN's nuclear weapons watchdog. It had always been the agency's job to monitor how countries respect non-proliferation treaties. Now El Baradai's team had to cope with an underground nuclear market selling not just to governments, but to the most dangerous of individual buyers. The network not simply worries me because of their supply to government, but the network worries me a much greater deal because of possible supply to terrorists.
He's hiding, most likely somewhere in the mountains between Afghanistan and Pakistan. But the world's most wanted man, Osama bin Laden, has never hidden his nuclear quest. He even obtained this fatwa, a religious ruling from a Saudi cleric authorizing the use of nuclear weapons even if they annihilate all the infidels. We are in a race against time because we know that Al-Qaeda and other extremist groups would love to have to, to, to get their hands on nuclear weapons. And to get his hands on those weapons, bin Laden wouldn't have to go far. Hidden in secret locations throughout Pakistan are 30 to 50 nuclear-armed missiles. It is A.Q. Khan's greatest legacy to his country. But the fear is that overnight, Pakistan could become a nuclear-armed state run by Islamist radicals. Pakistan's weapons are only as safe as the man whose finger is on the nuclear trigger in a country that has seen four military coups. President Musharraf himself narrowly escaped two assassination attempts in one week in 2003. According to the Pakistanis themselves, it was military officers linked to al-Qaeda who twice attempted to assassinate the Pakistani president and got reasonably close. If that's what's going on with the military guarding the president, we have to wonder about what's going on with the military officers guarding the weapons. They are in very, very secure places. There is no doubt in my mind that they can ever fall in the hands of extremists. But extremists are all around Musharraf, not just in his army. Opinion polls give Osama bin Laden a 60% approval rating here. When Musharraf fired A.Q. Khan, the Islamic religious parties condemned him for caving into the U.S. by humiliating Pakistan's nuclear hero. The entire nation has been disgraced. When you humiliate the symbols of a national pride, then you humiliate the nation. To understand just how close Pakistan's military has been to Islamist radicals, look at Hamid Gul, the former head of Pakistan's powerful military intelligence services lives in a military quarter with all the comforts and perks of a retired general. But Gul never retired from politics. He's an advisor to the far-right Islamist parties. This exclusive footage shows Gul at a meeting of hardline supporters of the Taliban still fighting in the hills of Afghanistan. Gul had helped the Mujahideen drive out the Soviets, and he even got to meet a certain rebel leader named Osama bin Laden. He wasn't a bloodthirsty animal as he's portrayed now. He came out to me as a very sensitive, a bit of a shy person, flashing black eyes, and a likable personality, I would say. Gul is not the only prominent Pakistani with unsettling sympathies. When A.Q. Khan exploded his bomb back in 1998, one of the leading nuclear scientists on hand was Sultan Bashar Mahmud. He ran the country's major plutonium plant until he was forced out when he became a fervent Taliban supporter. In Kabul, Mahmoud set up a charity headquartered in this house. Then, in August of 2001, the nuclear scientist had a very special meeting with Osama bin Laden and the number two leader of Al-Qaeda, Ayman al-Zawahiri. The Al-Qaeda leaders claimed they had nuclear material and wanted to know how to use it to make a bomb. Washington pushed Pakistan to detain Mahmoud. President Bush declared his charity a terrorist organization which provided information about nuclear weapons to Al-Qaeda. But Bush's stand-up guy, President Musharraf, was lenient. Pakistan authorities held the nuclear scientist for two months, then let him go. The honorary patron of Mahmoud's charity was none other than General Hamid Gul. He was also questioned, but never detained. 
Today, he remains unapologetic. The banner above him invites the entire nation to make jihad. And Gul insists Pakistan must be in the vanguard, willing to share its nuclear might with the Islamic movement. That's why the Islamic parties and the Islamic-minded people, they uh, are very fond of our nuclear capability. The combination of jihad and uh, the nuclear capability, it lends tremendous strength to Pakistan. It's 6.30 in the morning, and Khalid Kawaja is on his way to prayers. He also fought in Afghanistan and counts himself as a good friend of Osama bin Laden, meeting him a hundred times, he boasts. Now a successful businessman in Pakistan, Kawaja has become an unofficial ambassador for Al-Qaeda and its sympathizers. Kawaja says Muslim fundamentalists around the world have every right to arm themselves with nuclear weapons, so long as it is part of a defensive holy war. Now the enemy, if they have nukes, if they have missiles, we cannot fight with Kalashnikovs. So it is the duty of all the Muslims, in fact, to make the parallel kind of uh, weapons so that we can fight back. Indeed, in Taliban-ruled Afghanistan in the late 1990s, Al-Qaeda made a number of attempts to get their hands on fissile material for sale on the black market after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Osama bin Laden and his company must have had enough money to spare. They were the ones who could buy this. They may have got it already, for all you know. There is no evidence Al-Qaeda has the bomb yet. But if they ever got their hands on nuclear fuel, it would not be hard to make a weapon. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to make a bomb. What you need are two subcritical pieces of that uranium, and then you just physically could slam them together in your hands, and you'd get a nuclear reaction, a little tiny atomic explosion. In fact, when the Taliban fell, Al-Qaeda left behind revealing documents and plans, like this one, uncovered by CNN, called the Superbomb. It was an attempt to try to lay out a, how do you go about uh, understanding and building a nuclear weapon. We saw this document as, as establishing that, that al-Qaeda wanted nuclear weapons. And that, and unfortunately, um, no one has ever failed building one. We have to be right 100% of the time. They only have to be right once. And when you're talking about terrorism with a nuclear weapon or, or terrorism with a nuclear device of some kind, uh, you, you don't want to be wrong that one time. Even a small nuclear weapon smuggled into Washington or New York could kill and injure hundreds of thousands. The only weapon we have is this nuke. So if you attack us, so we have no other way, we will give you back this good gift. We don't mind dying, but our enemies, they don't want to die. It began as an Islamic bomb for one country. Now Pakistan has close to 50 nuclear missiles that could fall into the hands of Islamic radicals. And many fear the Islamic bomb has found another home in Iran. In front of this Iranian nuclear facility, hundreds of women have formed a human chain but they are not protesting against nuclear power in Iran. They are here to symbolically protect it from the West. Iran's radical new president, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, who has said that Israel should be wiped off the map, insists his nuclear program is for peaceful purposes only. But many are skeptical because of the man who sold Iran much of its nuclear technology. AQ Khan was not in the business of civil nuclear power development. And so when the Iranians say, oh, this is just for civil nuclear purposes, you have to ask questions about intent here. Why would you have had dealings with uh, AQ Khan? It's not just Washington that's raising the alarm. In this report, UN weapons inspectors state bluntly that Iran may have received documents from the Khan network, 
related to the fabrication of nuclear weapon components. The Khan network gave the Iranians plans to shape enriched uranium into hemispheres, which is only done for a nuclear weapon. It rang a lot of bells. The Iranians said, oh, we just got this stuff in the other material. We never did anything with it. We never asked for it. We never paid for it. It just showed up, fell off a truck. UN weapons inspectors also found evidence of a secretive plan for Iran's military to work with its nuclear scientists, testing high explosives and military re-entry vehicles. In other words, a warhead. It shows heavy military involvement. You're talking about uh, designing warheads. You're talking about test explosions, it looks like, to perfect nuclear weapons. Iran is probably still at least five to ten years away from getting the bomb, if that is their goal. At the Natanz enrichment plant, the Iranians boast they will start installing 3,000 centrifuges in the next few months. And just beyond the site is a huge underground chamber designed to hold as many as 50,000 centrifuges based on Khan's designs, enough to eventually produce fuel for more than 20 nuclear warheads a year. But to prevent that, the Bush administration has stated all options are on the table. If there ever was a preemptive military strike against Iran's nuclear targets, experts say it would have to be massive. Some of these things are underground and they're hardened, so you'd have to go in and, in one strike and break the top of the complex, and then you go down and break the next level of floor, the next one, and then down until you get where you want to be, so you easily would be up in the area of around a thousand strike sorties, a sortie being one aircraft on one trip. This is something we could do. In a quiet neighborhood of Islamabad, the man who started the worst nuclear proliferation crisis in history enjoys a quiet life of forced retirement. Still a hero to his country. A city suburb is named after him. A monument thanks him for making Pakistan unbeatable. But A.Q. Khan has left his own monuments around the world. Centrifuges in North Korea, Iran, and who knows where else. And the even more frightening legacy of a nuclear bomb without a home without a return address. Private groups, private tourism, private nuclear shops. Everything is private now. <laughs> Saif Gaddafi of Libya says AQ Khan has changed the rules of the nuclear game forever. Private tourism, like Al-Qaeda or other groups, they are private. They don't belong to any uh, uh, country. They don't have passports, they don't have nationalities for nuclear technology to go to a private companies. This is uh, globalization, this is a new world. The first nuclear age was about great powers facing off against each other. It was terrifying, but at least everybody knew the rules. In the second nuclear age, in the world of AQ Khan, there is no return address. There is no deterrence. The bomb could come in a backpack, in a briefcase in an ox cart. In the second nuclear age, we're seeing the privatization of the atomic bomb, the outsourcing of the bomb. It's a much more frightening world. For more information on nuclear jihad and other CBC documentaries, go to our website. Coming very soon to CBC Radio 1's Ideas, it's The Gift of Love, a documentary on humanitarian Jean Vanier. I'm Carol McNeil. See you this weekend on CBC News Sunday. We traveled to New York to speak with Mary Heron, the Canadian director of the new film, The Notorious Betty Page. Stay tuned. The National is next.